guys. Welcome to another Iron Edge podcast here. Today we're going to speak with uh, Tim Morton. Um, it's actually one of our uh, founders' brothers, lives out in California. Um, we're spe- specifically going to be talking about um, public service. Uh, he's on a school board out there in uh, California as a conservative Christian, which you know has got to be a little, a little tough to do. But uh, Tim stepped up last year, stepped in the arena in January, and uh, he's got some pretty good advice for us on uh, how to become public servants and uh, service to our community. So let's hear it out. Tim Morton, brother of Pete Morton. It's good to have you with us, man. Thanks for having me. Yeah, you know, we have to. It's obligatory. If I don't bring in the family, <laughs> then mom's going to get mad at me. So, <laughs> <laughs> no, but right. I mean, you know, you, she you're closer to you now. Yeah, she does. You know, I can get <laughs> grounded still. But uh, you're you're doing some pretty interesting stuff. Stuff that I never, honestly, um, thought I, of course, would never. I pigeonholed you into a, a box and then I thought you could do whatever you wanted to, but uh, uh, politics definitely kind of caught me off guard when you, when you told me about that and then what you were planning on doing. And I was like, ah, he's going to run. We'll see what happens. And then you got elected. So uh, you're, you're uh, on, on the Soulsville school board. So it's a local, local school board, uh, the school that your kids go to, right? Yes. And um I'm sure that's been it's an interesting time, of course, to be to be in politics in anywhere. I think uh, local politics, I'm sure, is even more difficult sometimes than than some of the nationwide stuff or statewide stuff that happens. But uh, what what in the heck? Well, first, tell everybody a bit about yourself. You know, I mean, what do you do normally? You know, and then maybe maybe what made you decide to to throw your hat in this arena? Well, um, <clears throat> I'm a businessman locally here i own a barber shop and so i meet a lot of people and it's a great profession i love doing it um but really what got me into this was my two kids i have two boys and they're elementary school age of course um and my boys uh, mean the world to me and so my wife and I have had a lot of challenges uh, regarding their education over the last, uh, what has it been, six years, seven years. Um, and I have helped in different areas of that, but my wife has spearheaded most of uh, the successful part of their education. Um, but I've gotten a chance to really get to know the school system. Um, I've worked within classrooms. I've partnered with teachers. I've seen students, you know, and how they perform in school. I've seen the curriculum that they get taught. Uh, I've gotten a chance to work with paraprofessionals and uh, special ed educators, things of that nature. So all that to say, when I made this move, it was uh, something that started out as kind of just, oh, a desire to get involved a desire to be a part of the community, to serve the community. Um, That's where my heart is. I've always been driven towards service. And I thought, man, what, you know, what can I do? I'm not a very athletic guy. So I'm not like, you know, the guy coaching the baseball team or, or doing soccer, you know, that kind of thing. Um, So anyways, we had an opening come up in our local school board. And um, I actually applied for it. You know, there, there's a difference between being appointed to a school board and be elected. And at first I tried to be appointed. Um, you go before the panel, the school board panel, and it's kind of an interview process. 
and uh, they passed me over. <laughs> I didn't get it. Um, they went with somebody else. Well, at that point, I was just like, oh, you know, it wasn't meant to be. I'm just going to, I'm going to move on, right? And I remember it as clear as day. I was driving home from work, and I was just talking to the Lord. I was like, okay, well, I'm just going to move on with this. Um, I'll just stay involved in the classroom, whatever. You know, we're in the middle of a pandemic anyway. So, you know, schools are pretty much shut down. Volunteers are non-existent. Parents aren't even allowed on campuses, right? Like, oh, I'll just wait it out. And I just hear the Lord saying, no, I want you to run. And I, and I just laughed. I mean, I was in the car by myself. I was like, this is funny. And I don't think I can do this. <laughs> well, hey, to provide context for everybody, what, what state are you in? I'm in California. Okay. Sunny oh, just California. To, just make sure everybody's tracking the, <laughs> the funniness of that request. Yes. Uh, I'm a, uh, a conservative Christian in California. So that makes it even funnier. <laughs> um Anyways, I, I just said, okay, Lord, you know, if you want me to, I will go ahead and do this. It's something that's been a desire of my heart anyways. So, <clears throat> um, so I, I had some signs printed up, posted them around town. I'm a barber. So, you know, I get to talk to people all the time. So I was talking to people and I was attending board meetings. And <laughs> I'll tell you what, though, this shows the power of a vote. I won that election by 11 votes. Wow. Okay. So for those of you that don't think your vote counts, it really does. <laughs> Even wow. in local elections. Okay. So the Lord squeezed me in there and uh, I've been there ever since. It's been a very interesting ride to say the least. Um, um, been I've been doing this for over a year now. Uh, I started in January of 2020. What is it now? It's 2022. I started in January of 2021. I can't even remember. You know, it's so <laughs> blurry. <laughs> uh, but um, you really get to see how um, school government works, you know, the, how the administration and the board partnered together it's been a really cool experience that way you also get to see the um the challenging parts of what we're facing right now um and going through a fear-based um challenge you know a fear-based time in our culture everything is wrapped around fear and you try to um bring peace to people's hearts and it's hard to do that through policy and in fact i would actually say it's impossible to do that through policy um and so when i go to the school board meeting i just pray that the lord will uh, allow his peace to come through me to everybody in that room because really the policy is not what brings the peace it's it's jesus right we know that um, so anyways, my, my wife and I are, are on this journey and it's, it's been tough. We've run into some, um, pretty big, um, I don't know, I guess just situations recently with all the, uh, people that are frustrated and, and a lot of division that's happening with the the uh, especially in California, where we're so strict about these mandates and and the pandemic stuff, you know, it's really um, becoming so divisive that it's tearing apart friendships. It's um, causing a lot of anger between parties, a lot of resentment. Um, you could see it; it's just boiling over in our public office areas. I went to a board of supervisors meeting the other day and you could sense it there. You could sense the frustration in people. We had a, a woman do an anti mask protest in the middle of the, <laughs> in the boardroom. They had to shut the whole meeting down. And, you know, that kind of thing 
is hard because all of a sudden all these decisions that are going to be made for that location, that locale, stop. Everything stops. I mean, we had to shut down our public works department for the day because they didn't know what they were supposed to do because a anti-mask protest happened. <laughs> and our board of supervisors couldn't make the decisions that they needed to make that day to keep things running. <laughs> so, I mean, this stuff causes a chain reaction. It starts at the top and it works down in every facet of our local government. And of course, we know that it's starting at the very, very tippy top of the country and of the state of California. So I'm just on the little educational side of it. But I'll tell you what, um, I had to come to a um, moment the other day where I was like, man, do I just, am I making a difference? Do I just resign? Do I, you know, what do I do here? I, I feel like things are so divisive right now. No matter what I say or what I do, there's someone in that room that doesn't like me. And they're, they're offended at what I stand for, what I believe, this and that. And uh, I went back to a, a blog post I wrote many years ago. And it was something the Lord put on my heart. It was called Finish What You Start. And I was like, okay, God, there's my answer. I need to follow through on the mandate that you've given me which is to be in this position. And it's, I'm not going to be the most loved person out there. That's okay. I'm not going to maybe see the difference that I'm making for my school district right away, but that's okay because I know that I'm doing your will at this point in my life. And so I need to stick it out. Um, we call that legacy wow. leadership. <clears throat> legacy what was leadership. That? We call it legacy legacy leadership. Most people don't understand yeah. that nowadays. They they have a very short term. What can I get for myself? Point of view from what I'm doing. You know, self promotion. It's just kind of in our culture. <clears throat> legacy leaders are like the founders. The founders, I think they knew that they would never see the fruit, the full fruit of their labors, right? But they went into it anyway with a vision for the future, something they pass on to their kids and their kids and their kids. And it, and it did, I mean, it created the greatest nation in the world, but it was something they knew they were never gonna see, but they did it anyway, because it wasn't a selfish ambition. It was legacy leadership. Right. I think that's kind of what you're talking about right there is, is what God doesn't see things, you know, with time and space, like we do, you know, he just sees the big picture, which is infinite, which is hard for us to fathom. Um, and we have, we play a, play a role in that. And I think you're, you're finding that out. So whatever you, you end up doing now may have, may resound in the future, you know, where, where you don't see the, the, the benefits of it. You don't see what you did, but it still affects, you know, that, that great commission, what we're called to do, right. Which is each other people. So I think it's, it's pretty cool that you're, you're seeing that yourself right now. Yeah. So let me, let me jump in here. I happen to know you for a long time too, even though, you know, Pete and I are the same age, so you're the little brother. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Chad didn't brother. pick on him as bad as I did, that's for sure. <laughs> um, we were no. we were forging you, man. We were we were purifying you to get you yeah, ready thank for you. this. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. I feel purified. <laughs> I'll say this for all the interwebs to hear. Tim, you're you're a good man, and I'm proud to know you and proud to be your friend. Um, but so you've you know, thanks for, thanks for coming on and, and sharing your story a little bit with us. Um, you know, one of the things we're curious about are the conflicts that you found being in this arena uh, regarding politics and then being a Christian man in that arena. And, you know, uh, so, so yeah. So what have in this, this short, but really long year, what are some of the things that you've learned about that? Um, Gosh, that's a, that's a really good question. And what I'm going to say is going to kind of fly in the face of 
um, everything I was raised in politically. Okay. And when I say politically, there's a difference between there's a difference between Jesus morality and political morality. Okay. And political morality, it you know, you can pick a side. Okay, I want to be Democrat, I want to be Republican, I want to be independent, this, that, whatever. When you pick the side of being on Jesus' side then your life should, as a disciple of Christ, emanate Jesus. And I was thinking about Jesus the other day. I was thinking about his example. Because right now, we're surrounded by issues where people want you to pick a side. And if you don't pick a side, then you are a coward. You are... um, somebody who is double-minded or that doesn't commit to their cause and they look down on that. I was thinking about this because here I'm a Christian man trying to show Jesus to the world, even in an area where frankly um, Jesus has been taken out of it. You know, God has not been the center of our <clears throat> government for a while, you know, whether it's local or state. And uh, he showed me that, um, actually, uh, he showed it to me through the story of um, the, uh, the uh, money changers in the temple. And how, of course, you know, we know the story. He came into the the temple and he thrashed the money changers. He was upset. He was angry. He had that righteous indignation that we all read about. And he said, you you know, you've you've made my father's house a den of thieves. You know, it's supposed to be a house of prayer, right? And I was thinking, Christ had that righteous indignation. But what was it? What was it for? If you look at it, it was for God's house. It was for his temple, his place of worship, which we know we are. We're his temple or his place of worship. He's jealous over us. So I was thinking, okay, well, there's a lot of Christians right now who want me to be on their side. And then there's a lot of non-Christians right now who want me to be on their side. So how do I handle myself in a way that's Christ-like? And and he started to show me, well, first, you need to do what I would do. And that is not allow my place of worship to become a den of thieves, number one. Number two, he said, you know, he said for the Romans, give to Caesar what's Caesar's and to God what's God's. Who does my life belong to? My life belongs to God. What is my jurisdiction? My life is my jurisdiction. I need to keep myself pure before him. And then everything else follows. This is my jurisdiction right here. And then as I keep myself, then that will start to affect the world around me. You know, Christ didn't come to abolish the Romans. He didn't come to abolish the politics of that time. He came to bring righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Ghost. And that is not a political agenda. It is, is, it's just not. It is all about the fruit of the Spirit and manifesting the fruit of the Spirit. And so he was just showing me, you got to manifest the fruit of the spirit. I need you to manifest my righteousness, peace, and joy. I need you to be uh, having that righteous indignation about things that are holy, that are righteous, that, that things that are um, going to continue to allow praise and worship to me. I need you to 
to be fighting and champion for those things. But when it comes to all this other stuff, I just need to be a vessel that shows righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. And I was like, oh, geez, okay. What does that look like in a boardroom? <laughs> yeah. Dude, that's awesome, Jim. You're spot on. Like, so <clears throat> I love how, you know, the Pharisees always tried to, you know, uh, pigeonhole Jesus. You know what I mean? They constantly were trying to get him on technicalities, you know? And every time you read, you know, whether it's the stoning of the widow or, or, or whatever it is, right? Every time you, he, he comes into that conflict, um, you always see him. He, he doesn't, he doesn't, he doesn't pick the right or the left. You know what I mean? He, they try to draw a hard line for him to pick on one side or the other. And he totally rises above it. You know what I mean? He always goes back to like what you said to a godly morality, right? That he goes up to that upper level and goes, okay, what should we really do? You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Here's a stone for any of you that wants, that doesn't have sin, go ahead and cast it. You know, right. I love that part of it. And that's exactly what you're talking about, man. That's spot yeah. on. That's hard to do though. Like you said, how do you do that in a boardroom? Man, when you got two sides screaming and yelling and some lady at the mic, you know what I mean, protesting and stuff, that is hard to remain that calm and keep your mind actually clear of the clutter to try to look for that third alternative, to stay above and, and, and try to, you know, show that love. Props to yeah. you, man. That is a hard to do. <laughs> well, and to be transparent, I failed. You know, I <laughs> failed many times. I mean, there have been, there have been moments throughout this, this year that, have just not been not been my best you know and okay i'm done beating myself up over that but <laughs> um yeah how do the other board members um like how do they feel how do they react i mean do they, are they feeling the same thing like so much tension um that they're trying amongst the board members yourself are trying to you know to to lead the group you know what i mean or or is the board even as contentious as you know, the board and, and then the school district, are they even as contentious as those down on the floor trying to be heard? I think our board actually, we're very blessed in that we all um, agree to disagree on some things and yeah. we get along very respectfully. Okay, That's- if you, you have boards out there that, that don't do that, you know, it, it, it depends on the, it depends on the manners of the people, depends on their, degree of self-control you know and i mean we all have um various things that we are super passionate about when it comes to this stuff but we also realize that we're not there just for our individual selves um we are there for the the district as a whole and i think that's another aspect i wanted to to bring up is that um when you're in a, a public service office you have to remember that you're you're a public servant i think a lot a lot of political uh or uh well i'll just give you an example okay when i first got into this somebody said oh you're going into politics huh and i looked at him i said uh i never thought of that actually because i don't like politics (laughs) yeah nor politics Um, yeah uh but I looked at it as a way to serve my community. And I was talking to another board member about that. He said, that's really the kind of mindset we need to have at the top. You know, we need to have people that realize, hey, I'm there to serve the community. And like Pete said, that's legacy leadership. You're not there to serve yourself. You're not there to, uh, to further your own agenda. And so, I think as a board, we actually have a good grasp on that. There might be some people there that have, you know, they have their desires, they have their dreams and their goals, and they're working their way toward those ambitions. I get that. But when we work together, we're working together for the um, district as a whole and keep the district running smooth and keep the schools open. You know, that's our goal is to keep these kids educated, keep them in the classroom, you know, uh, one of the things I, I made a point at one of our um, public meetings, because we had, you know, we had a few um, kind of, I guess, call them town hall meetings or whatever, where the public was really involved and 
everybody was going on about anti-masking and anti-vaccine and all these kinds of hot topics. One of the things I said, well, there are kids in our school that get their three meals a day. They get their clothing. They get their parental support from the school itself. You know, we have these, we have a problem in our society where parents have either disconnected from their kids because of their own lifestyle, or they've disconnected from their kids because they're just selfish people, you know, and, and lifestyle goes into that, you know? And so these kids are basically raising themselves, no guidance, no foundation, no, no sense of morality. Um, nobody's taking care of their needs except for the individuals at school, the staff, the administration, the folks around them, the school counselor, that kind of thing. They can see those kids' needs and meet them. And so one of the things I brought to the, the people's attention was we need to keep the schools open, if not just for them. You know, we need to keep the schools functioning and maintaining, if not just to see those needs met, because nobody else is doing it. They're going home and they're floundering. Yeah, Tim, one, uh, you know, on that note, when, uh, when I was getting my degree, I was actually working as a, a paraprofessional at a school at an elementary. It's actually the elementary that I went to. My fifth grade teacher was still teaching, which is kind of crazy. Um, <laughs> but there's like two males in the entire school, right? And so I got picked to be the disciplinarian guy, right? And so I'd take care of those while I was teaching computer classes and all that stuff. And uh, so three or four kids got in trouble on the playground. And, um, and this is up in Page, Arizona, uh, far northern Arizona. So you're, you're surrounded by reservation, you know. And so this is where I, it, it drove home, like how impactful, you know what I mean, that the school itself really is on a kid's life. Um, couldn't get a hold of one of the kid's moms. So I pulled his record and I got to drive him home. Well, driving home is actually about 45 minutes out into the reservation. And, and the address is literally at mile marker this, turn right drive down the dirt road, you know what I mean? To the, to the third cactus, hang a left. Like that's literally like the directions to get to this house. And so I drive to this place out in the middle of the reservation and it's a little square brick house. That's it. You know, one room, it's only a one room thing. And it actually had no running water. It was literally like a shack, you know? Um, and I'm looking at this kid and this kid's in fourth grade, you know? <clears throat> so we get there, show up. It, it, it's very dirty, very, um, you know, reeks of urine and everything else, right? Open the door, there's nobody there. Um, can't find anything. So I can't, you know, he's a minor. I can't just drop him off. So down the road about a mile, you can see there's a couple um, government style homes that are built. So I drive down there and sure enough, there's a, a lady down there in the first house and she's got a couple of kids. And uh, so I start talking to her. Well, this kid pretty much is raising himself. Um, that hasn't been seen for who knows how long, you know what I mean? And the mom is, is in and out spotty, you know? So most yeah. of the time, like his meal usually comes from her house at night, you know what I mean? And then he goes back and sleeps in that and catches a bus back to school every morning, you know? So mm -hmm. there's literally no food in that house. There's no, there's literally just a bed and stuff, you know? Um, so it's like that drove home how important, you know, because sometimes you get, um, you get really, intra focused right and you're like oh I, why do we have all these programs for these kids at school why do they have you know breakfast they don't need breakfast they should get breakfast from the house well you know what there's a lot of adults out there that aren't doing the right thing you know what i mean and if we're going to be good solid christian men um there's some of those things that we need to support because they're not getting the support anywhere else man so right. props to tim for stepping up and like because sometimes we do man we you know we, we get very internally focused and we get biased towards everything else man and we forget that there's legitimately People going without breakfast, you know what I mean? And sleeping in a shack in this country, which is insane to me. Right. Yeah. Yeah. It, I think what you're getting at, um, you know, me, I study the foundation of our country pretty in depth. I'm passionate about it. But you look at the leaders that stepped up back then, farmers, lawyers, you know, teachers, you know, university professors. Uh, those are the people that stepped into those leadership roles that ended up building the foundation of our country. And, and they didn't do it um, 
with parties involved because there were no parties involved at that point, right? Uh, it was a joint effort to fight against oppression. And at that point, it's physical oppression, which requires, of course, response. Um, but it wasn't uh, based on uh, self-promotion, things like that. I don't think that you could actually find one founding father in there that was trying to promote their own agenda at that time. Uh, it was, I want my kids to grow up in a free country, period. I want my grandkids to grow up in a free country. Uh, I'm going to work together with these groups. I mean, you had like Quakers and different religious organizations that have some really interesting viewpoints uh, on war and things like that, that, you know, you're trying to fight with to get, you know, a, a resolution passed to, you know, create, create this country, you know, and fighting us to the largest superpower in, in the world at that time. And, um, but they did it, they worked together. They have really different ways of thinking. There was a crisis that came together. They promoted uh, courage, and things like that over fear. It wasn't like when you see a lot of countries where they're they go into revolution or war, you see refugees, right? Just refugees everywhere. They go to different countries. They have to leave. You didn't see that in the United States of America when we went to war with the greatest superpower in the world. It was because of the leadership and the what, what they were promoting was courage, you know. And it was, hey, we can do this. We can overcome this. I know it looks bad. Yes, some people are going to die that kind of stuff, you know, but we can do this, you know, as a country. And they did, you know, and I think that's the kind of leadership we need. I think what you're doing is right on, Tim. I'm comparing you to the founding fathers right now. You need to tell mom that and make sure she's tracking that I'm, uh, I'm, I'm giving you the self-confidence you need to keep going. But it's true. That's the kind of leadership we need. And it is in serious. We have a serious deficit of that kind of leadership. I don't think it's anywhere to be found right now. It's, it's very rare. And you see those, but you see those rare leaders in our nation, you know, in the state, the local level, and they stand out, you know? So I think you're doing the right thing with that. I think that's the, the, the proper attitude to have when you go into it. I'm a Christian. I care about my family. I care about the future, you know, of this country and their legacy. And that's how I'm going to lead. Yeah. Well, it's been, um, I was going to say, it, it, it's been interesting <laughs> because there's a lot of things that I, I think of personally, um, things that I'm very strong about, convictions, um, belief systems, these, these things that I grew up on or these things that have developed in my lifetime that I would love to see promoted in, um, in this level. But one thing I'm finding is that... Um, you have to kind of, you can let those convictions drive you. You can let those convictions actually steer your decisions. That's fine. But you cannot allow those convictions to drown out the voice of people who possibly don't believe the same way you believe. That has been the most difficult part is because you want to promote what you think is right in this setting right it's like okay well i believe you know that you know i believe in the 10 commandments you know i live my life by the 10 commandments well then you have another person over here who's very active in our district and they don't believe in the morals of values of the 10 commandments and and so all of a sudden you have two ab ab abrasive uh, conversations going on because, or an abrasive conversation going on because one person believes something and one person doesn't. How, as a a uh, a leader in this arena, do you do you step aside and say, "Okay, Lord, I'm not going to start preaching at them, start trying to ram my my commandments down their throat, my convictions down their throat." I'm just going to try to live the way that you lived, which was to express righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Ghost. And that's what I, I was getting to earlier. And there's, a, of course, a, a real lack of that right now within the political arena. I don't even know if people know what true righteousness, peace, and joy is, you know, but but those of us that do, we have an opportunity to build bridges with 
the opposing uh, convictions <laughs> out there. And those bridges will come by us expressing the character of Christ, even in arenas like this. And so I appreciate um, the leaders within our community that do that already. I've noticed a few. Um, but I think we need more of this to start happening. And we need to encourage men of God that have this kind of heart to start to run for these positions because we need public servants. And I'm not saying we need public officials. We need public servants. You know, we need people that will step up and that will serve the community rather than serve themselves. Yeah, I hope that yeah. uh, you don't have too many of those people that don't believe in the Ten Commandments so they'll just end up digging their own grave eventually. You know, thou shalt well, not kill, thou shalt not yeah. steal. <laughs> I was, like, I was using, don't cheat on I was using it as your spouse an example. with your neighbor's <laughs> wife. Those things always end up badly. I'm just saying, eventually it comes back. So you can just let them flounder, I guess, if you want. But well, it is uh, you're right, it's California. Uh, <laughs> you're exactly. I'm pretty, I'm pretty sure in our politics, all of those are being broken constantly, yeah. Yeah. and they're getting covered <laughs> up. And but a, a few things that stick out to me. So just some perspectives that I want to bring. Um, one, we talk about founding fathers, and we see the old, the gray wigs, but these were young men. Is there in their 20s and 30s, like early 20s and 30s? You know, yes, I'm sure there are some guys a little older, but they didn't even live that long back then. Uh, so just to be stepping up, I, I guess we'll still consider you a young man, Tim. Uh, Thanks. But yeah, you know, just the, uh, and, and the reason I think they were able to do that, the, the principles, but there's one word that you, you keep saying the righteousness, peace, and joy. And there's one word that keeps ringing in my head, and that's truth. And that's a that's a controversial word these days for some reason. What's true, uh, but what we do know is that Jesus is truth, and if we start there, um, then I think we we have the right we have the right uh, baseline. I think my dogs are like freaking out here. Sorry if you're if you're hearing that they're sleeping sleeping in Trabit or something. Um, <laughs> So, uh, so, so anyways, that's just one thing, um, one perspective that I wanted to just highlight that I think you're bringing, you, you know, even if you're not saying something, you're bringing it in the, the person of Jesus, the truth that resides within you. And you can walk that out because you're not swayed by things that are untrue. So that's, right. that's just the baseline. So that's one thing I appreciate. The other thing that I was thinking of having just traveled to the UK and seeing England, I was in Westminster Abbey. And you have, you know, over a thousand years of history and people that impacted um, the world. So what 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 res what was resounding to me was all these politicians, all these scientists, all these teachers, all these musicians, all came out of the church, and the impact that. And, and, and I don't even want to just say the church um, because that can quickly get convoluted uh, with, you know, th with the politics of the church. But I will say out of the influence of the word of God, the truth of God. And so um, that is one of the reasons that I think it's really important that men of faith get involved in all areas of life. We've heard it in recent years called the seven mountains, you know, these areas that we can have impact in. But I think, you know, for every person, they need to live their faith out in whatever arena they're in and whatever opportunities that God puts before them. So having said all that, just my little, my little perspective, uh, you know, um, what is some advice that you can give to our guys? Because uh, I know we have a lot of guys that want to be involved and they want to uh, take up a cause as, as men of faith. Uh, but what is some advice that you could give them when they're thinking about specifically throwing their hat into this arena of local politics or even beyond? Well, number one, pray. Pray that that's where the Lord really wants you. Um, you know, he, he gives us uh, passions for certain things. He gives us desires for certain things for a reason. 
And we want those passions and those desires to be steered in the direction that he wants. We want his will done. So that needs to be done with a lot of prayer. Um, I prayed about this for actually a couple of years before I made a move on it. Um, so that would be number one. Number two, if you're going to go into an area like this, you have to, um, you have to be focused on why you're there. And it, and it, ha- it comes down to two things. Are you there to further your own ambitions and have a selfish agenda? Or are you there to serve your community? And I think that um, if you go into it with the attitude of, I'm here to serve my community, then you need to be open to hearing what your community says. A lot of times we will shut out our community because we're so focused on what we want to bring to our position in order to get to the next step. And so yeah, it, Tim, I think that's why there's a protest in Canada right now, because people aren't listening to their community. Right. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like you still got to listen, you know, go yeah. on. Sorry. No, that's fine. Oh, you got to listen to your community and you have to be okay with listening to all sides and trying to come up with a good compromise. Um, And I know we don't like to hear that word a lot, Um, but I think compromise can actually be a good thing when you're coming up, when you're bringing a great solution to some of the issues that we're seeing nowadays. Because right now everybody's doing this, but if we were just take a step back, compromise, we might actually get to be where we're doing this. We're working together on some of these issues. But right now everybody's really, really not wanting to listen to, I don't wanna to listen to your opinion, I don't wanna to listen to your opinion. Okay, well, Tim, go ahead. Have you, yeah. ever, uh, have you ever read Dr. Covey's Third Alternative? No, I have not. Oh, dude, read it. It's awesome. So it's kind of, okay. talking, it's the same thing. It kind of goes a little uh, contrary to compromise because it, what he lays out is like, you know, if, if you're plus one over here on, we'll just say the right side and you're plus one over here on the left side, compromise actually brings these guys down and these guys down, right? So you do come to a, a, a middle ground, but yeah. these guys are losing a little bit. What he's saying is you've got to, I hate the term, get out of the box. Right, but, but you've got to get out of the box. And he's saying you actually find a third alternative up here that still stays on there, plus one line and plus one line. You oh, know, that's good. Uh, it, it's read the book. He's got some examples. It's it's pretty interesting. Um, it, it, I use it all the time at work here. You know what I mean? When we get when we get a hard line, they're like, well, we got to go one way or the other. I'm gonna go. Do we? Do we legitimately have to go left or right on this thing? Right. Or is there a right. whole other alternative that actually encompasses both sides, and I get to get it both? You know. Yeah, that's good. Um, yeah, one of the ones I uh, on, in the political realm um, when uh, the previous vice president was up on the stand and he was he was uh, in an interview and, and he was asked about um, abortion, you know what I mean, and where he stood on it. And it was interesting. I'm like, huh? Well, this will be fun, you know, because that's that is that's a, a left and right, right? Like it is mm-hmm. a hard line. You got to be on one side or the other. And it was interesting because he almost used that concept. What he did is he actually rose above it. He didn't, he didn't dive in that divisive politics. And actually what he did was he actually started talking about adoption hmm. and all the problems around and how we really should be folks. And we're so concerned about this, this bottom issue, but really what, which, how, how come it costs $10,000, right? But I can, it's, mm-hmm. it's 300 to cause abortion, right? But it's, but it's like $10,000 to do an adoption and, and, and just the mass amount of kids that, you know, and so it totally took, like, to me, I was like, that's, that's pretty awesome. You know, yeah. So yeah, it's called uh, the third alternative by Doctor uh, Davy Covey. I think is his first name, but uh, okay. yeah, just like what you said, man. It's you, you can't stay on the that that hard line left right thing, man. You got to figure out a way to keep it moving forward. You know what I mean? Right. You get a win win out of it. So, right. Sorry, yeah. Go on, man. That's all. No, 
that that's great. Thank you for that. I'll I'll actually have to look into that book. I'm always looking for <laughs> good reference material, <laughs> things to uh, bring more knowledge. Hey, hey, um, one one last yeah. thing that I was thinking of um, that you and and Jed both alluded to today. Just thinking about Christ's example, um, you know, obviously he wasn't a politician, <laughs> but what did right. he do? Uh, you guys were talking about the needs of of the kids there. Whenever Jesus went somewhere, he first led with the compassion. It's something that mm-hmm. I realize is a lack in my life, um, and I'm trying to work on. I feel like I have empathy and compassion, but when I when I step back, it's like I got a long, long, long way to go on this compassion thing, and it, it certainly reaches way past our politics and what mm-hmm. we think about a situation. Um, so bringing compassion into these arenas, you know, following the example of Christ. Um, and then he was, you know, I, I, I probably said this on here before because I say it a lot, but you know, people don't care what you know till they know that you care. And so, um, just showing that you care about your community, you know, and, uh, then you can have these open doors and sometimes, Sometimes it's the sidebar. It's not necessarily maybe the big forum, but it's the one person you get to impact. So I just, I just want to commend you, Tim, for what you're doing. Uh, you know, I've been able to journey through life with you a little bit and just see how God's used your character and um, your impact on, on your community, small little mountain community, beautiful mountain community in California that I tell people all over the world about. Um, you know, just, just commend you for what you're doing. I want to encourage you to, yeah, what if if this is next, if you continue on down this road, whatever you do, just keep doing it the way you're doing it, man, with integrity and truth. And so uh yeah. Thanks, Thank you. Thank you, brother. Thank you. Right, Tim, and, you know, props for stepping in the arena, dude. There's so many of us spectators out here that are, you know, uh screaming at the TV, yelling at the politicians, right? But we're actually not stepping in the arena. So, dude, kudos for stepping in. Uh um, thanks, Judd. <laughs> Awesome, man. So last word goes to you, man. How do we uh, encourage those men out there? Uh, last word goes to you. How do we do it? Well, just uh, take that uh, passion to see the world, um, the community, whatever it is you have, to see it um, go in a different direction and pray and see what the Lord reveals to you and where you need to stick that, um, that passion and that desire and he'll show it to you and then get to know, um, get to know your government in your area, whether it's going to school board meetings, supervisor meetings, whether it's, uh, attending your local, you know, whatever, whatever it is, just get more involved and see where you can plug in. Hey guys, we hope you enjoyed this little talk on a different arena, uh, the area of politics and um, serving our local local government and our communities. We want you to be inspired and empowered to go do these things that God puts in your heart. Uh, we believe, uh, you know, part of the reason we're doing this Iron Edge thing is that we can sharpen each other uh, so that you can go and do these things. And, you know, you can impact your communities. You can bring big impact uh, long term. And so we encourage you to do that today. And, you know, if you have any questions, reach out to us. We can surely connect you to Tim. Uh, But, you know, dive in and, uh, you know, sharpen each other, sharpen your community. You got this.